Thanks. Um, I'm thrilled to um, be able to come back to MoMA um, and see friends Tommy and Peter. And thank you all for coming out. Um, please let me know if I'm speaking too fast or if you can't hear me. Just raise your hands or, or yell or something. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is my um, most recent book, The Communist Horizon. Um, and in many ways, my, the book and my comments are anchored in the um, US context where anti-communist rhetoric um, is still really strong. Or if not still, it's strong again. Um, and, and, it, and it's strong again in part because of the inability of the US to escape from its um, Cold War past and the Cold War framing. Um, I think, though, that rather than just being kind of um, a talk that's only anchored in the US, US experience, I think that since 1989 um, and the presence and undeniable um, impact of neoliberalized global capital, that there are broad possibilities for um, communism today and for the claims for, and for reclaiming communism, particularly against um, radical Democrats on the one side and anarcho-fragmentist on the other side for reclaiming communism as a political ideal. And we see this theoretically in um, work that has been opened up um, by Zizek and Badu, but of course that was already, you know, they've been working in this area for a while, as have um, Hart and Negri and others. Um, but there's still been a new intensity around that work, and I would say in part because of radical um, movements that have been happening over the last four or five years. Whether um, you know, oc um, occupations here, like in the university in 2010, or in the occupations in the US, um, not to mention um, Arab Spring and um, the uh, debt opposition in Montreal. So um, what I hope is that as we come back into um, discussion at the end is, is you know, to, to is to get a sense of whether or not the frame I'm offering is, is too American or whether no, in fact, there are points of convergence that make this make sense in a variety of contexts. So um, the title is you know, The Communist Horizon. Well, what do I mean by that? I use the term horizon to denote a fundamental division. Right? It's the fundamental division that establishes where we are. Now, typically, you know, people use the term horizon spatially, right? Like that, you know, this physical horizon. Or you might think about it temporally, like lost possibilities, stuff that's in the past. What's interesting, though, even in both of these versions, the spatial version and the temporal version of horizon, both of them actually are also referring to a fundamental division, right? And a division that establishes where we are, a division in relation to which we get our bearings. And so my claim is that the communist horizon remains that fundamental division, right? The division between the capitalist present and something else. Now I get the term from Bruno Bastilles, who gets it from Alvaro Garcia Linera, who's the guy with the white hair in this picture. And he was, um, is vice president of Bolivia with Evo Morales. And um, Garcia Linera uses the expression, the communist horizon, in one or two speeches, but also in an interview um, that he did with a reporter who was criticizing their party. And he says, look, whatever we're doing, we've got our eyes set on the communist horizon, our expecting and desiring eyes. And I love that term because I think it gives us a sense of how a division can actually be something that orients our politics. So rather than politics being, oh, this one little thing here, this one little thing there, in fact, if we think about it in terms of a fundamental division that establishes where we are, we gain an orientation. Now, what I'm gonna talk about tonight will be six tags that I think um, communism, or six sort of key words or key themes that communism tags, six ideas. Um, let's see, let's go to those. And, um, and these are also the, the, the ideas that I develop more fully in the book, but I'll describe them briefly tonight. So um, in, the pre in our present situation, um, in kind of everyday conversation or everyday life, particularly in the US, when folks, hear the term communism, they usually think you mean the Soviet Union, or they think about maybe some kind of force that's present. And then even if they're not really thinking about it, we can still find within the kind of actuality of the present communism as the 
sovereignty of the people or the push of the people, or that's what I'm going to argue, that it also appears in the present in these discussion of the common and the commons. And then two, um, and then I would say it's also present a kind of collective desire, and I will explain that using um, kind of Lacanian terms, but I hope not too many. And then um, there's communism as the actuality of revolution. In these six um, different tags, or six different features, in fact, the, they follow a kind of dialectical structure where the first two are, are negative and the next two are more positive features or substantial features, and the last two are kind of, denote a kind of thrust or movement or motion. Now, before, um, before I say too much about what these six tags are, I think it's important to say what the, what the point is, like why bother, why do this? Um, why, why rehabilitate communism now rather than you know, go with everybody around democracy? Um, I've already suggested one reason that it can orient thinking and action. I think that the language of communism is so resolutely anti-capitalist and internationalist that it can rupture with present, um, with the kind of present um, fetters on political thinking and activism. It breaks through nationalism, right, with its, with its strict internationalist core. And of course, it resolutely affirms anti-capitalism. And I actually would say that communism is the only name that we have that all by itself says anti-capitalism. Anything else is somehow complicit in capitalism rather than saying no. Um, so I think that if we think about our theory and action with respect to communism, we break away from a politics thought in terms of the kind of momentary aesthetic disruption or local projects, you know, like, I don't know, urban gardening or chickens or something, um, that we break out of the hegemony of parliamentary democracy and instead have another goal, another idea, another orientation for action. Um, so when I'm, you know, in this plea for or this um, emphasis on the communist horizon, um, I'm, I think that we get um, both a negative and a positive politics one that is the abolition of capitalism, right? That's the negativity. And the second that is the positive creation of global practices of egalitarian participation. I mean, I'm sorry, egalitarian cooperation. Again, what this is opposed to is a politics that is, emphasizes inclusion or issue awareness or lifestyle change or participationism, which is very strong in the US, where the goal is like always just to get more people to participate without any regard, like maybe these are really bad people, right? I mean, like as in like neo-Nazis or Tea Party people or something like heart racist or anti-feminist, like why would we want them to participate more? Right? I think that's a, a, a kind of bad politics for the left. So this is against you know inclusion as a goal, issue awareness as a goal, participation as a goal, and in favor of a politics resolutely focused on the sovereignty of the people over the economy and the collective power of a divided people. Now I'm going to explain more as we go along what I mean by thinking about the people um, as divided. But first, so this first tag, what is it? Um, when people hear, um, you know, that, oh, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about communism. And I think this is the case not just in the U.S., but, um, you know, also um, in parts of Eastern Europe, people immediately think, oh, God, you know, the horrible Soviet experiment. Um, and they think that, the, so, that, that communism is, the, is identical with the Soviet Union. Well, this is obviously a factual mistake, um, not surprising in the U.S. Um, after you know, 40 years of Cold War. It's a factual mistake because the Soviets never claimed to have achieved communism. Right? That was never they cl their claim, even though they did call their party a communist party. Additionally, this idea that Soviet Union equals communism is a mistake because the Soviet Union changed over time. Right? It was never just one thing. It moved from a revolutionary regime, a time of war communism, um, the repressive Stalinist period, the stagnant Brezhnev period. It was never one thing. And so when folks try to say, oh, the Soviet Union is the same thing as communism, I mean, one's immediate response should be, well, wh when? At what point? Which time do you mean? It can't have always been that. So that's the first problem when people try to say communist equals Soviet. Um, additionally, this, um, this kind of claim, and this also, this also happens when people want to say, oh, well, you have to be attuned to history. 
And I'll say, yes, you do have to be attuned to history. But what, mo what often happens is that when this is raised by anti-communist is they say, well, attuned to history means Stalinism. And so you can't talk about communism unless you mean Stalinist. Well, this is also a mistake, um, particularly in the US con uh, context, because the period when the Soviet Union was Stalinist was the period when the US was allied with the Soviet Union. Right? So it's only a very strange denial of, of US history when Americans say, oh no, it's Stalinist, because that's when Americans actually liked the Soviet Union, right? Uncle Joe, the, you know, Stalin was called Uncle Joe Stalin. We had actually a military alliance. You know, he's featured, you know, positioned in magazines, and there was there was um, you know cultural exchange. So there was a time when Stalinists did not mean this sort of negative thing. But okay, so that's another reason that we can't just assume this equation of communist, Soviet, or Stalinist. Additionally. Um, there's another problem. Let's say, let's say we give my kind of imagined opponents here the benefit of the doubt and say, well, of course, it is important to acknowledge the, um, you know, the gulag and the repression and the authoritarianism of the Stalin period. Um, that's correct. But to say that that is communism is a kind of ideological gesture that treats one period as determining of everything, while capitalism is ultimately movement and change and open opportunity. So what, what happens in this equation of Stalinism and communism is that there's an ideological maneuver happening where there's one determining feature of all of communism, and that one determination opens up this idea of capitalism as, oh, it's always great change and wonderful. So it's, it functions as an ideological me mechanism to let this binary appear, where one thing is totally determined and the other is completely opened and changing, as if there were never changes in the Soviet context, as if there were not multiple, commun not multiple socialist experiences, as if, this, as if the communist effort itself were actually not a reaction to capitalism. So it's a bad kind of history that starts immediately with this communism equals Soviet Union equals Stalinism. All right, so since we've got that out of the picture, this communism as, as the Soviet Union, what about understanding the second idea of communism or the second way that a communist horizon um, determines where we are? And this will be this, um, what I'm call a present force. And um, by, um, with this, I have in mind the way that anti-communist rhetoric is so bizarrely present in the contemporary US. Um, the radical right loves positioning Obama as a communist. Um, if anyone knows anything about his ties to the big banks, you know this is crazy. The national health care policy that he tried, that he pushed through, which the right calls communist, in fact established markets in health care. It made everyone have to participate in a market. It was a market maneuver, not in any way a socialist or communist maneuver. But the right likes to use this anti-communist language. They use it against feminism, health care, public education, um, and of course, um, Obama. Now, my claim is that this anti-communism is not just old, I don't think it's just the old rhetoric. I don't think that that tells us why it's used. I think that it's come back because the right recognizes the extreme deprivation and exploitation that is now undeniable in the global capitalist economy. Right? The right is acknowledging the extreme inequality. The right knows that the um, finance sector made out like bandits, that the 1% is richer and richer, and that the majority of the people, this is now particularly in the United States, but I think this is happening everywhere, um, are worse off than they were before. So how, do they, what did, how does the right respond to this? By demonizing the one word that they know is synonymous with anti-capitalism. They're trying to you know, head it off at the pass you know, prevent it from becoming, from reappearing. They're trying to stain anything with the name communism because they recognize that communism is actually the one name, movement, and force that has been opposed to capitalism in history. 
Okay, so that's the first way to think about this, um, this present force of, commun of communism. It's present in the right-wing imaginary as this force that arises um, of anti-capitalism that they're trying to head off, and they're trying to head it off because they know that inequality is undeniable. But it's not just the right um, that's opposed to communism or that makes anti-communist arguments. You also see a version of anti-communism on the left. Um, this comes out on the left primarily in the way that the left, uh, and now this, I think this is the case, I know it's the case in the US and the UK, and I'd be interested if you think it's the case here, but the primary characteristic of the left is that it claims not to exist. Right? It says, oh no, we can't say we, or what do you mean we, or we doesn't mean anything, right? I'm, you know, I'm different, or they're different, or we need to begin by exploring all of our differences, because we is a dangerous totalitarian move, and you know, there's no such thing as the left. We can't, we can't, um, we can't speak in this way, right? which is also a performative contradiction, but I'll leave that aside. So the left likes to emphasize its own fragmentation, its own difference, its multiplicity, taking what I think is clearly its incapacity to be an, in, to be an indication of its strength or a kind of strength. So the left, um, the left claims not to exist. It treats its own fragmentation and multiplicity as a strength. And I think it does, and then, and with this, it then rejects anything that it thinks of as totalizing, all-encompassing, as claiming one kind of politics, namely a class or anti-politics, as the most important. So I think that the left embraces this multiplicity because of its rejection of communism. And it has to turn then, with, the, with it having, um, uh, demarcated itself against communism. Oh, I, I'm going to make a side. So I put that thing from Ronald Reagan up there because it's it's uh, interesting to me that the way that the left repeats this language that actually Reagan was already saying in the 80s, like there's no left and right, right? People act like, oh no, this is post politics. Well, frankly, this was a right wing position that was forced on people, and now you've just you know pr properly internalized it. Okay, so the left um, has turned to to democracy instead of communism. Um, and in embracing democracy, it denies its own complicity with capitalism, its own failure to make the capitalist economy the primary problem. It also denies its own acquiescence to forms of nationalism and forms of identitarianism that um, our own, that flourish within this idea, well, we just need to have democratic inclusion and make sure that each kind of position gets its own space. Okay, so this then, I'm rendering this as the kind of present force of, of communism. It's present in our setting in a right and left version, both of which have to do with a kind of lack or a kind of loss. And that, so it's not present as like, oh, a really terrific, inspiring communist party. It's present in the way that the ideas and movements shape themselves. So I'm going to move to the sovereignty of the people. There's all my, there's my cat. People, yay. OK. So um, in arguing that communism be understood in terms of the sovereignty of the people, I try to, I'm trying to make an argument that functions like the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, but in our, but for our environment, for our environment um, in um, a more global economy, an economy where um, industrialization has been moved to different places, where a number of, of countries, particularly in Europe and basically particularly in the north. Um, encounter conditions where it's very difficult to think of oneself as a proletarian or as a worker. And I started thinking this way in part because I was giving um, a talk like this in a, um, you know, an artist space in Brooklyn. And um, the, like, at one point someone in the room said like, well, who here is a proletarian? And no one thought of themselves that way. No, I mean, everybody was a kind, everyone in the room was a kind of contingent worker at some level, but the language of proletarian wasn't working. 
um, not for any kind of identification or recognition. It seemed actually kind of alienating. So I thought, all right, let's think then about um, the language of the people um, and recognize proletarian not as an empirical designator, but as a process, right? Proletarianization, as people are moved into, are moved away from um, opportunities of sort of security, opportunities for um, making a decent life, but instead become more and more fragile and contingent, more and more um, having to sell every parts of themselves in order to basically in order to survive. So I want to talk. Then, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this idea of the sovereignty of the people, and the idea is supposed to be that we can think about that in a way, kind of like the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, I've, I've been. I was criticized by um, Alberto Toscano on this because he says, "Well, um, the people is not a Marxist category." And I think that's crazy, right? I mean, the, um, the people have always been a Marxist category. It refers to the revolutionary alliance of the oppressed, right? It was the workers and peasants alliances, all the alliance of all oppressed people. So I think that we can, within a Marxist um, legacy, use the language of the people. And I think it's preferable to the language of the proletariat, as I said, because I think it captures more where we are. And I think sovereignty of the people is preferable to the language of dictatorship um, because dictatorship is temporary. Right? Dictatorship is a temporary form. And we know that you know, it was temporary on the way to the kind of withering away of the state. Well, it seems to me that as long as there are people, we will need to collectively organize ourselves and collectively steer and govern ourselves. That that's a condition of being people in collectivity with one another, is some kind of collective self-governance. That idea of collective self-governance, I think, is the core idea of sovereignty. Right? So I don't think sovereignty is just this idea that comes over from the you know, old idea of the king that then is mapped onto the people. Rather, I think that sovereignty has to do with a form of collective self-steering. And I actually think that self that collective steering over our condi the conditions where we produce um, and secure our needs is the truth that is obscured in democracy. Right? A democratic idea of sovereignty of the people is supposed to be the people taking control of their lives. But insofar as democracy fails to address capitalism, it never is able to, to do this. All it is is becomes like either the vehicle of the rich to secure their own legitimation, or sometimes, if we're lucky, the vehicle for the poor to make their conditions not quite as bad as they usually are. All right, so again, I'm making an argument for the sovereignty of the people as a way to replace the notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And it's important here to think of the people not in a populist or nationalist way. So I think of the people as a divided totality or a divided group. So people never designate, and the way I'm trying to theorize it is people doesn't designate some kind of homogeneous unity. Rather, the people designates um, an open, changing, shifting um, collectivity. In practice, this is always the case, right? The people don't exist as an entity. They've never existed as an entity anywhere. I mean, we, nobody even knows who's a member of a nation. No one knows who's really a member of anything because most of the time people are going back and forth. Some people are active. They may be active for a time. Um, sometimes you might have to try to get people to vote and then they never vote. Um, sometimes people don't get messages. They don't know and a decision's made anyway. But in fact, in all of our collective experiences, there's actually never a closed totality. Now, it's been a nationalist state project to make them. But if we think more conceptually, we recognize they try to make it because, in fact, the people are always a fluid, open group um, that can't be thought of in this closed way. In um, the Lacanian jargon or theoretical tradition that, I, that also informs my work, this would, you would call it um, that the people are non-all or incapable of being closed. Or I also like thinking about the people as di um, divided. And here, um, I, th I think it can be persuasive with an analogy of, with the individual. Right? So when folks think of the individual as a political unit, we tend to 
think about the individual as somehow making rational choices. But as soon as we recognize something like the unconscious or involuntary will or things that we do accidentally, then we recognize, oh, of course, the person is, a, is divided as well. There's not a kind of solid, you know, solid unitary individual. And, and if we recognize that, then we can actually, I think, recognize as well that collectivity as similarly divided, non-all, has different components that are not reducible to some kind of decision or cognitive um, yeah, um, assumption. Okay, so, um, right, so, so the idea then is replace dictatorship with because dictatorship is temporary, replace it with an idea of sovereignty because sovereignty refers to our collective determination over our collective conditions. Now, I want to talk about, so that was the third kind of tag for communism or and as a way to think about what the communist horizon might be for us. Um, the fourth one comes out of the current discussions of the common and the commons. And these discussions of the common and the commons are also appear in kind of liberal managerial contexts as well as the radical democratic and communist context. Um, but one of the things that makes it um, kind of exciting is it seems like if, if there's going to be anything to a return to co um, communism, um, thinking about how we organize in common and how we have common practice has got to be crucial to it. Um, and I'm looking for now, where's my quote from Michael Hart? One second. Um, sorry, one second, I lost my quote page. Well, oh, crap, I can't find it. Um, I want to, um, in talking about the commons, um, I wanted to begin with this quote from Michael Hart, where basically the, the operative words of this, um, of this quote are that the common and the commons provide the condition and weapons for a communist project. And I liked this idea of condition and weapons, right? So it's not just like, oh, there's things are already in common, and so you know, this is easy. And it's not just that we have to, that we collectivize stuff as a weapon. It's like it's got to be both. So in thinking about this idea of the common as condition and weapons for a communist project, I want to think about Facebook or social media. You know, Twitter could work, um, YouTube, um, what, um, Kontaktia is the Russian version, but so social media or basically Facebook. I think they let us think about the common as conditions and weapons for a communist project because with social media or Facebook, we make it in common, but it doesn't belong to us. And it's really clear in social media, right? If our friends weren't on it, we wouldn't do it, right? If people we know weren't participating in it, we wouldn't participate in, participate in it, right? We, it's only through our collective engagement in it that the thing exists at all. And I think so, this is clearer in social media, maybe than anything else you know, that, that we've ever encountered, how it's irre that it's only our collective interactions. So we make it in common, but it doesn't belong to us. Social media has, is typically talked about um, in, I would say, in sort of, kind of mainstream context as problems of privacy or, or distraction or, or bullies or like, stupidity or something like that. And I think all of that misses the point. The real point, of, the real thing to look at with social media is the form, right? It's a form for the production of relations. And it's a form where cooperation appears to us directly as a productive force that arises out of our combined and, multiply, and um, multiplied efforts. So in this form, we see more than in, in any other thing, right, how cooperation generates something and produces something new. And it's just our efforts. And one of the things I like about this is it's not congealed into the commodity form. Right? With social media, there's like a direct production and exploitation of, of what Marx understands as the social substance. So rather than value having to move into the commodity form, it's directly present in social media as the social substance. Um, and um, Google is interesting on this, for, um, on this um, 
count, right? Because the Google directly seizes that with link um, with um, what's it? What's the name of the with PageRank, right? PageRank only um, makes sense because of the way that it captures the social substance. The set of links and values that people have is directly expropriated without having to go via a commodity form. So um, the form then of of social media gives us a sense of productive relations done cooperatively, um, but in the ones that we have, um, they don't produce the means of life, right? It's just relations by themselves, but they don't produce means of life. They don't produce food and shelter, right? Or they don't even produce for the vast majority um, the money or the means to buy food and shelter. So we're, here we really do have a kind of pure productive cooperation radically detached from food and shelter and means of life. So this makes social media actually an instance of a real contradiction, right? In the old fashioned Marxist terms from capital, right? We see a real contradiction here. Um, and you know, it's as I mentioned, it, it might be obfuscated by you know sort of discussions of stupidity in social networks or a bunch of cat videos and cat pictures. But ac and it's also really obfuscated by horrible arguments like this guy Chris um, Anderson, who emphasized how everything is free on the internet, and that's really the worst part. Um, unless you want to say, oh well, actually he's really a proto-Marxist um, who's recognizing the collapse of the value form and the collapse of the wage relation. But I, that's not really true. In fact, he actually acknowledges um, it's a highly competitive environment that will let some people get rich. So I think that um, that the 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 key to thinking, or one key, like one place where we can see the fruitfulness of ideas of the common and the commons for um, a revitalization of communism is in the contradictions that manifest in um, social media. Because the problem of social media is the problem of capitalism, right? Private property um, and ownership of our communicative acts, right? Our, ba the, our basic sociability, our communicative acts are alienated from us, right? Not just work, but everyday stuff. And now with big data, right, it's the same for everything we do, right? Walking through the street, oh, on video, captured, um, communicate, like I've got teenage kids, so I only communicate with them through cell phones. And um, all of that, right, immediately expropriated from us, right, in, you know, in, in big data forms. So, um, we have then collective production, um, so we have manifest this contradiction of collective production and the contradiction um, of ownership. Okay, so these, so so far I've given kind of a negative version of or how, how communism is manifest in this negative um, fashion, right, through things that are critical of it, and also how it's positive manifest, positively manifest in these kind of more substantial ways of the power of the people and in this, um, and in this, this sort of production of the commons. I now want to talk about it in terms of a, um, more of, a, of the force or movement of communism. And this leads to kind of more conceptual how, what, what does it mean to really think about what communism can be for us in, in a kind of more conceptual way. And here, my idea, um, my, my basic idea is that we cannot think about communism in terms of individual desires or preferences. That if there is anything like communism or can be anything like communism, it has to be understood as a collective desire. Um, and it has to be understood as a collective desire because if it were just the product of individual desires, it would be no different from capitalism. It would just be another capitalist object, right? Like any old thing that we pick. It wouldn't let us escape from the kind of anarcho-fragmentism, right? It would just be any other choice. Rather, so given that, I think that we have to conceive communism in terms of a collective desire. And it can't be also, it can't, it has to be a, a particular kind of collective desire, one that is a desire for collectivity, right? So it can't be a collective desire for, let's say, money or a collective desire for um, purity. It has to be a, a kind of desire that takes itself, right, its own collectivity as a goal. In making this, this abstract argument, what I'm trying to do is to take the sort of constitutive gap that I mentioned earlier, this fundamental division of the people, 
and make this the mobilizing intuition behind communism, right? So that this gap isn't filled in in any kind of state project, but remains a collective project for our own collectivity. It replaces individualist desire with the collective desire, and a collective desire to keep on with collectivity. Now, I know this sounds sort of abstract, but we can think about it as what happens when we are engaged in active practical struggle, right? Or in active um, practical cooperation with other people, right? The real key whenever we're in um, active, active struggle is not letting our own things get in the way. So it might be like you know, our own you know, um, homework or housework or fears or desires or ego or narcissism. But the real challenge um, that we actually always address in practical um, context, whether or not it's a, you know, it's super activist practice like in, in, like in occupations or if it's in various kinds of aesthetic or cooperative practices, we see in those a collective desire for collectivity working on the individual and changing the individual. Right? So the change comes about in active practical struggle. All right, so then this leads to this final um, kind of tag um, or sort of thematic that communism opens up, and that's the um, actuality, actuality of revolution. Um, in, um, in, in the US, um, and I think that this is not just in the US, but among any um, discussion context where liberal democracy is the primary idea, um, revolution tends to be dismissed as typically a messianic event, right? If you think about revolution, then oh, you're impractical, you're not realistic, you're put, you know, you're you're waiting for the Messiah to come and change everything. But as we know, revolutions really happen, right? There's nothing messianic about revolution. Revolutions are the chaotic, are chaotic political change. They're a point when people won't go on any further and the existing regime cannot go on any further. So the fact that revolutions happen, I think directs us towards thinking about um, politics, um, particularly communist politics, in terms of organizational forms. And I would say even more specifically in terms of forms like the party. This does not mean the party as a ruling state form, but the party as a form that directs energies or guides energies or opens up energies within a revolutionary context. We know in a revolution anything can happen, right? I mean, one of the huge disappointments for the Egyptian revolution was that it didn't go in, it went in an authoritarian direction. Right? It went in ways that were that kind of crashed the hopes that I think everyone kind of globally had when we saw hundreds of thousands of people in Tahrir Square. But I think the, the, the key to that, or what's interesting about that, is why did it go in some directions rather than others? Because some people were better organized than others. Right? They had taken the trouble to not be in sort of fragmented groups, sort of worrying about you know, their lifestyle, but in fact organizing neighborhoods, um, organizing themselves on the ground, and they fought as an organization. So I would say that the actuality of revolution, and this idea actually comes from Georg Lukacs, right? He um, develops this in his theorization of, of Lenin, his book on, on Lenin, The Unicity of His Thought. And he emphasizes that the, um, the party, as Lenin conceives it, um, is a necessary um, result of recognizing the reality of revolution. So, one can, um, so we can let revolution happen to us, or we can try to push revolution in directions that are, um, yeah, in com are compatible with the collective will of the people and the collective determination of the people um, over our own conditions. So I'd say that the party deals with the split in the people. It recognizes that the people are split and responds to that by trying to direct it in some way, direct people in one way rather than another. And if it's a communist party, it also has to keep open the gap rather than try to fill it in. It has to keep recognizing the division um, and the challenge of collectivity rather than assume that it's an achieved or substantial given. All right, so I'm interested to hear what y'all think about this, so thanks for listening.